Hello, everybody, and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, and our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, offer the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I'm Evan Irwin, and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Hello. Ruben Bressler. Hi, how are you? I am terrific. We're back on track. Aaron, you feeling okay? Yeah, I feel really good. Um, I've had a bit of a tickle in my throat the last couple of days and some sneezing, but um, I think I'm out of the woods for the most part. I didn't, I'm trying not to repeat the experiment. <laughs> so like I didn't take a nap before the show. I made sure to eat very different things for lunch today. So I'm just trying to, you know, okay. switch up the variables a little bit. <laughs> Toss it up as we all try not to go stir good, crazy. Good, good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week, or at least the last show, in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most eloquent in letting us know what card we did not choose as one of our top ten pingers. Ruben? Well, uh, my favorite comment of the favorite pingers comes from Mary Green, who writes, My favorite pinger is certainly a bit non-standard, especially since it's only been printed once and only in Commander. As an artifact, it can go in any deck and is tied to a much-loved tribe. I'm very surprised that Acorn Catapult was overlooked. For only one mana and tap, you can deal one damage to any target, and the target's controller gets a squirrel token. You can ping your own creatures like Dinos Within Rage to get a token, or chip that point of damage to replace a pesky X1 with a sweet squirrel baby. And being an artifact, there are so many ways to untap and use multiple times. Ruben, you're the squirrel person in the cast. That's I, on you. I am. I'm squirrel friend <laughs> is what I am. I and, am. Uh, you know, you, you you knew where to tickle me in, in the sweet spot to get that comment. So, nice. Nice, please. Well, for those who don't know, from Commander 2011, now more worth almost three bucks, Acorn Catapult is a four generic mana rare artifact that has one generic tap colon. It deals one damage to target creature or player, which has been updated to any target. And that permanence controller... Or that player may create uh, creates a one one green squirrel creature token. Oh, so there you nice. go. Nice. That's sweet. I've never seen one in the wild. But... I mean, again, they only printed that one time, like right. what, <laughs> nine years ago. Like okay, yeah. only printed that one time, and you need like a specific kind of setup in order to make it worth it because you don't really want to give. It's like Forbidden Orchard, right? right. Like you're not just going to see Forbidden Orchard in every deck, even though it fixes your mana. You know what that might go good with is that um <clears throat> that really weird green and black card. I think it was in Theros Beyond Death, the Grim thing that gives opponents tokens. And then when things die, probably yeah, you can have a home in that the kind three, of deck. three that gives everybody tokens. Yeah, where you're already yeah. giving them things, and then you the, want to just yeah, play like, like you know. He's like a troll dwarf yeah. shaman. I forget what it is. No, it's, it's like a yeah. fungus thing. It's yeah, like yeah, yeah. green and black. Yeah. yeah. The three, three. I know what you're talking about. Give your about. opponents creatures, and then play like Virulent Plague, and be like, yeah, Acorn, a time. yeah, Acorn Catapult is one of those cards that like sort of like ties the EDH deck together. When someone goes, oh, I didn't think about Acorn Catapult, <laughs> and you're like, Acorn Catapult, and it just solves everything and interacts with 20 cards or whatever. No one suspects the Acorn Catapult. There you yep. go. Congratulations to Mary Green. Please contact Aaron on social media before she blocks you on all of them. <laughs> Thanks again to CoolStuffInc.com for sponsoring Did you this see giveaway. that somebody messaged our Facebook account because I had blocked them and they were... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I did notice that. I didn't know what that message was about. I was yeah, because like, there were no words. It was just like a story and two acts of just screenshots. And yeah, I was like, I don't I know what. I don't know what that was. <laughs> Grismold the Dread Sower. There we oh, go. God, that ugly thing. From Commander 2019. <laughs> My friend Robbie had a Grismold deck, and it was bananas. And it, and so you can do dumb things with it. And I think the Acorn would yeah, fit in really well we given go. the theme. We did it. Old, old Grismo. Yeah, that, Grismo. that face. I can't get over that face. <laughs> Jeepers. Man. All right. Costly, so man. let's go so ahead and get started nice. here. Uh, this this particular option, you know, at this point, sometimes I just, you know, I'm looking at magic cards because of whatever reason, and I'll see a magic card that does something, and I'll go, oh, maybe we should talk about the topics of why, and that's where the pingers came from. And so I was like, oh, okay, pingers are cool. Let's go see another one. What we thought about token makers? We can talk about token makers. There's like 1,300 freaking cards yeah. that make tokens yeah. we could we do yeah. wooberg colorless lands like okay everything makes tokens for me personally i really tried to aim for cards that would give me more than one because lord knows there's a lot of like etbs where it's like mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the eldrazi will give you like a scion or something or a spawn you know i didn't really consider those i wanted something that you could kind of um abuse or really get a lot of tokens out of mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah, same. I wanted to be token, not just something that makes a token, right? Mm-hmm. Like Yavimaya sap herd is nice and it makes a token, but that's not going to qualify for what I want. I want tokens makers. Yeah, I got I got a bit sort of all over the place. Some of them are all stars. Some are makes a lot of tokens. Some of them are sort yeah. of classic token makers. And we'll go ahead and get started with number 10. Ruben, what's your number 10? My number 10 does make uh, multiple, multiple, multiple tokens, if you're putting it in the right deck. It's long been an all-star of multiple formats, um, including Vintage, I believe, for a little bit of time at the very least. It is in the cube. Uh, It is one of the top 128 favorite Magic cards, according to the MTG bracket. And it's just a cool, uh, uh, interesting, unique card that started a new type of card really my number 10 is young pyromancer Ooh. young pyromancer is a colorless and a red for a 2-1 human shaman originally an uncommon in magic 2014 when you cast an instant or sorcery spell put a 1-1 red elemental creature token onto the battlefield um yeah, introduced pyromancers now there's seasoned pyromancer uh, a couple of other types of creatures out there that make uh, one ones when you cast certain types of things like murmuring mystic um yeah so young pyromancer is just spectacular it took a while to take off too i don't remember having this i don't remember this card having any real impact in standard right. and it took a little while for the modern legacy vintage crowd to really pick up on this but when they did man there are still people out there that even when it's bad they want nothing less than to cast a young pyromancer and abuse it with cabal therapy um, and force of will and daze. It's very yep. easy for this card to get out of control. Um, and that's really all you need. You can do a Delver, this bunch of spells, and you pretty much have a legacy deck. That's pretty much what it was for a long time, sort of the pyromancer <clears throat> pile. Yeah. Um, and, and it's nice that it, we have this sort of pyromancer thing with seasoned and young. Uh, maybe they'll go back to it in a different way, you know, because mm-hmm. we got those words in our lexicon and they, right. they mean all sorts of cool things. Um, and so the seasoned one still makes tokens, but not in the same way. Um, right. Young pyromancer was the closest, probably the closest that blacks or I'm sorry, that reds ever had to having something like a dark confidant, like a mm-hmm. two mana really yeah. really terrific creature that's own stoneforge mystic you know type thing right it, it goes in that pantheon of stoneforge mystic tarmogoyf mm-hmm. dark confidant snapcaster mage the, the right. sort of two drop that's a colorless and a and a non-colorless mana right. together this is the closest they've ever come really right the, the epic two mana you know red card or whatever and why do they call it seasoned pyromancer because he's tasty because <laughs> he's a snack because <laughs> he's well done. Amen. He is a snack attack. God, right really. There. Oh my God. Aaron, what's number 10? My number 10 has a couple of modes to it. Um, you can either choose the mode to make some tokens, or you can also just decide to up and have your opponents lose the game. Uh, my number 10 is Mirrodin Besieged. Mm. Uh, Mirrodin Besieged is two and a blue. It's from Modern Horizons. It is an enchantment. As it enters the battlefield, you choose Mirren or Phyrexian. If you choose the Mirren side, whenever you cast an artifact spell, create a 1-1 colorless mirror artifact creature token. If you choose the Phyrexian side, at the beginning of your end step, draw draw a card, then discard a card, and then if there are 15 or more artifact cards in your graveyard, target opponent loses the game. Now, the wording on that is very interesting. It doesn't say you win the game. It just says a person loses the game. Um, And so this is really, really cool. I had tried building this with my Sharoom deck, but my Sharoom deck also had a lot of reanimation, so it was kind of going opposite of this. But Mm. um, this is really interesting, very flavorful. I believe PV got to preview this when Modern Horizons preview season was going on. It's a very, very sweet card, very flavorful. You know, the first mode is not bad. Obviously, if you're putting this in an artifact deck, if you're trying to get the latter half, you're going to be able to trigger the first half as well. And so whatever you need this card to do, it can do it. Um, And just it's really, really cool. And I would love to play it sometime. Yeah, this is also one of those really cool and unique spells that's named after a set. There's Mm -hmm, only so many cards that also have set names. And so um, let's see, what are some others out there? Uh, Well, there's Torment, Planner Chaos, Conflux. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, all good stuff. Although Conflux this one, being in you're Conflux. right. Conflux was in Conflux, and this one's backwards. You're right. There was the set, and then this card was named after the set, as exactly. opposed to uh, Torment or Apocalypse, where the card came first, right. and then the set came after. There you go. All right. So uh, my number ten here is a classic. I don't, I don't know if it's in the cube. I don't. I haven't checked lately. Uh, it was always in my cube from the day I made it until the day I didn't have it oh. anymore. 
Uh, and also, there are many people who will build cubes and put the Spanish, I think it's Spanish or Portuguese version yeah. of oh, Maloku the Clouded mm. Mirror, who makes tutus <laughs> in yeah. that language. Maloku the Clouded Mirror recently showed up in one of my favorite sets or blocks, Champions of Kamigawa. I know it's terrible. I love it anyway. Maloku the Clouded Mirror is four and a blue mana. So five mana for a two four flying Rare legendary moonfolk wizard. For one generic mana, you return a land you control to its owner's hand and put a 1 1 blue illusion creature token with flying onto the battlefield. It's awesome. Yeah. Moonfolk, sneaky mm. creature type, has <laughs> multiple creatures on the band list of various kinds um, uh, between Ereo and I forget who the other moonfolk is that's banned somewhere. But um, Maloku is is a nice one. And uh, you're right. It go, In the misprint cube, when you can go get like the reflecting pool that is foiled incorrectly, so it has a planes in the foiling, you can mm -hmm. search for it with your fetch lands. Um, then, uh, then yeah, the, the, the foreign Maloku that makes tutus even more ridiculous. Right. Back in the day, this was a control finisher. Like it would just, you know, a, 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 a turn or two of returning your lands to your hand and replaying them. And yeah. suddenly you got a monster army and they're all just dead. Um, and it, it was just good in queue. It was a limited bomb. Then it's a limited bomb. Hell, even to this day, I would, would consider this ridiculous if it was yeah. printed in a standard set as a limited card. Though these days we're like, well, why doesn't it have like, you know, haste or something? Right. Two, wow. four for five with flying that makes creatures, but I have to return lands to my hand. I, that's not a rate that I can. <laughs> can we just pay have, one and make a one that one? Rate, that's that's rate. too far. Why that's isn't fine. its power three? Why? Mm. Why is it only a two four? Why can it be a four four? Right. right. It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Let's move on here to number nine. Aaron, what's your number nine? My number nine, I, I can't even look at it because... <laughs> Because I, I, I've experienced what this card is portraying, uh, just recently. And I just, I just look at it and I envision it and I feel it and it just gives me the heebie jeebies. Aaron, uh, family show, family show. <laughs> In a bad way, not a good way. Still uh, family nine... show. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> my number nine is Crawling Sensation. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh -huh. So Crawling Sensation is two colorless and a green. It's an enchantment from Shadows over Innistrad. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, you may put the top two cards of your library into your graveyards. So this was in my Moldrotha deck for a long time. And then it says whenever one or more land cards are put into your graveyard from anywhere, for the first time each turn, put a 1-1 green insect creature token onto the battlefield. So if this happens to not trigger, you're still playing Gitrog, you're still playing Dreamborn Muse. Um, there's a number of ways that you can mill yourself, and it really doesn't matter how you do it. Um, the first land that you put in your graveyard will trigger this thing. And so you can then just have a wave of tokens. You can make your tokens really big. But I'm mm -hmm. the kind of person where if I see one bug, even if it's not near me, I mm -hmm. will spend the rest of the day just imagining there's a bug on me when there isn't. And so I can relate to this card, and I've also you know put it to good use on many occasions. I mean, it does sort of what you want it to do. It's exactly. there to fill up the graveyard. It's yeah. there to make creatures and stuff. So flavorful, too. It's, it's just, and it's got that line of text that Aaron can't help but love. You could put it on any card <laughs> at the beginning of your upkeep. Put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. Put it on literally any <laughs> other piece of crap. Right. Put it on Aaron Squire would, and she's doesn't there. matter what the rest it. of the text is. Done. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Underbelly Squire. She's there for it. <laughs> got it. Sorry. <laughs> Ruben, what's your number nine? My number nine, uh, again, Cube All-Star, uh, Pro Tour winner, back when blue-black control was the deck to play at Worlds in 2010 in Chiba. Mm -hmm. Guillaume Matignon won the All-Guillaume Finals against Guillaume Wafotapa with blue-black control, featuring Grave Titan as Ooh. the main finisher. Very nice. Grave Titan is uh, originally from Magic 2011, part of the Titan cycle. Four colorless black black gets you a 6-6 six, six giant with death touch. One of those 6-6s six, with death touch. Just just because you... Oh, I don't know, man. When Grave Titan enters the battlefield or attacks, create two 2-2 two, two black zombie creature tokens. So that's 10 power across three bodies in black, which was not a thing we'd ever seen before. This one was very uh, early thought to be the best of the titans right. um, high, probably, high on rate yeah probably ended up third best of the titans overall but still incredibly good 
yeah, the, the the Titans themselves are just like they were bananas. They they yeah, showed up in Commander twenty eleven, and then they made a giant mistake and reprinted them in Magic twenty twelve. So we had like two full nonstop years of just Primeval Titan forever. Like it got to the point where like the Titans started to like cycle through each other. Like the mm-hmm. White Titan would start to show up, and then even the Blue Titan showed up because people thought, oh, the Blue one is completely unplayable, and then well, the Blue, the blue one, one was events. The Blue one is the Titan mirror matchup winner. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. you tap their Titan. <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was it was just bananas. And it's like, yeah. okay, it's where we're at. And then they reprinted Manalik and these ridiculous creatures. And it kind of sucked there for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, this is also a popular reanimator target. Um, yeah. Especially if you're up against a deck like Death and Taxes. You don't want to be mm-hmm. playing anything with a legendary name. Because they're just mm-hmm. going to Karakas it anyways. So mm-hmm. yep. um, it's very easy to do this. Delver decks have a really hard time if you reanimate this. So it's a great backup target in our toolkit. Um, you know, the, the thing that always stands out to me about Grave Titan is the art. I, I spent years not even noticing. Look at that art really closely. It's full of corpses. And the corpses are all falling out. They're dreaming from the hands I, it just the minute i saw that my world changed because i was like holy crap and uh, just incredible art just some of the best i've ever seen it is it is a super super cool card uh let's see here moving on here to my number nine it is a card that we've spoken about uh recently uh for a few reasons few different ways um but uh regardless this is also one of those cards that kind of had like a time in the sun and then kind of got overshadowed by sort of a bigger brother type thing Mm -hmm. Um, because I remember when Magic Origins first came out and no one was talking about Hangerback Walker and then Mm -hmm. everybody and their mama had this deck, had this card in everything and just started to go everything and vintage shops players started playing it. Like it was just crazy, crazy until Walking Ballista showed up. Let me tell you, Hangerback Walker (laughs) was the stuff. Even with Walking Ballista, it still it's what, still a, a it's fine still card. Yeah. It's still very... Uh, that said, Hangerback Walker is 2x in generic mana. So XX for a 0, zero rare artifact creature construct. It enters the battlefield with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. When it dies, you put a 1-1 one, one colorless thopter artifact creature token with flying onto the battlefield for each plus 1 plus 1 counter on Hangerback Walker. And for a generic mana, tap colon, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Hangerback Walker. So you leave it alone. It gets scary. You leave it alone. It gets scarier. If you kill it, it pops out of my of one ones you got to deal with those things so it was good early it was good late uh it was good in aggro and it was good in control like there was a whole variety of ways hangerback walker just did everything for like a year or two yeah Yeah. and i remember in standard it was relatively fair like i don't think there were any things you could do to break it at that time it It was just great no yeah Yeah, it was just it was just amazing yeah it was just amazing and even decks that you wouldn't think of as being artifact decks or token decks had room for this card Mm -hmm. um and then once you started getting into the older formats that's where the hardened scales came into play and that's where archbon ravager came into play um you know mishra's workshop being able to put this out on turn one with a counter was devastating um you know pairing it with foundry inspector and and reduction effects Mm -hmm. and so um just a really really good card that continues to see play it makes combat a nightmare Mm -hmm. um you know it's it's just Mm -hmm. really really good yeah Yeah, combined with Tromoka's Command uh, and a number of other token makers in the Green White Tokens deck that, of course, won the Pro Tour. Also, just in Abzan, like you had access to all of the mana and all of the crazy spells in every color and still you wanted an artifact in your deck. That spoke to the power level of what uh, Hangerback Walker provided. Yeah, that thing shot up to like 20 bucks overnight and pretty much stayed there until it left standard. Turns out goodness. we're all hangerback girls when you get right down to it. Hey yo. I ain't no hangerback girl. I don't know. <laughs> number eight. Ruben, what's your number eight? My number eight is one of my hires that's on somebody else's list. Fair enough. Aaron, what's your number eight? All right, Ruben, this one's for you. You know, I'm hey. not just a graveyard person, okay? I have range. Yeah. I have flexibility. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna you give sure you do. a I'm going to give you a Boros card. You, How about you that put, for your nerve? You put nerd? cards into your graveyard with with spells and also <laughs> abilities. Oh, a Boros card, you say? Oh. That right. doesn't even mention the graveyard. It doesn't even have the wow. word graveyard on it. Okay, um, this is a fixture of my Queen Marchesa deck because what's a queen without her army? My number eight is Assemble the Legion. Yep. Nice. Um, so Assemble mm-hmm. the Legion is three colorless, a red and a white. It was originally printed in Gate Crash. It is an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, put a muster counter, not mustard, muster, M-U-S-T-E-R, mm-hmm. uh, counter on Assemble the Legion. Then put a 1-1 red and white soldier creature token with haste onto the battlefield 
battlefield for each muster counter on Assemble the Legion. This thing gets out of hand very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people have to read this and don't realize just how quickly this spirals. Um, They just assume that you're kind of getting one token per turn, but oh no, you're getting more. Um, This was even a finisher in the control decks at the time. You know, you'd run no creatures um, and you would just slam and assemble the Legion and you would stall the game until it got out of control. Um, There was a red-white control deck around that time or just kind of a mono-red, big red deck that really liked this. Um, I love it in my Marchesa deck. It gets out of hand very quickly. You can attack with those creatures. You can also block with those creatures. I've sacrificed them to Westvale Abbey before. Um, so whatever you're into, this card can do and just really flavorful in terms of representing, you know, the Boros Legion and, and their ever growing ranks. And I just love it. Yeah. This is also a card that took a minute to kind of catch on. Mm-hmm. Like it came out in Gatecrash. People were like, all right, sure, whatever. But, you know, there's that other red, white, you know, card that they all wanted to play. <laughs> um, the three mana guy whose name escapes me. Boros Reckoner. Thank you. Uh, so Boros Reckoner was there and they're like, don't worry about the symbol legion thing let's just put this out here right. and then say go and then put us out there and make it and say go and make it two tokens say go and then all of a sudden it's like oh god i'm dead yeah. it was ridiculous it got out of it control was, it was a it was a really popular sideboard card it yeah. was yeah. featured in some of those patriot control decks uh, yeah. as basically a planeswalker that you couldn't attack mm-hmm. i mean you just played it and then you sat behind counter spells you just had your counter fluxes and your you know your azorius charms and you were just like all right make Someday these tokens will kill you. Someday I will have enough muster tokens, counters on my muster assembled legion to kill you. Someday. One yep. it might not be today, might not be tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. We will definitely get you. All right. So uh my number eight here is a very popular card. Uh not so much these days. I, I'm not I guess the um card that it combos with kind of goes in and out of style also the card it combos with is only been printed once which kind of blows my mind they didn't even put it in the mystery booster but okay whatever um back in the day which now is back in the day back then was just uh, you know new magic cards uh well back we were, in the day back in the day was just the day it's true it was just <laughs> the day so in the day right we were cracking open packs and getting really excited about alara reborn and alara reborn had a lot of really cool stuff in it uh, a lot of interesting things that it was trying and uh, one of the things it was trying was the weird hybrid mana stuff on artifacts at the time. And mm-hmm. they said, okay, so we're going to make this thing and we're going to call it uh, Thopter Foundry. And Thopter Foundry oh. is a blue and a white slash black, an Orzov mana. So Orzov plus blue, two mana for an uncommon artifact that has one ability. One generic mana, sacrifice a non-token artifact, create a 1-1 one, one blue Thopter artifact creature token with flying, you gain one life. So let's look up Sword of the Meek. This card is eleven dollars because it's only been printed once wow. in Future Sight. That's ridiculous. Man. Thanks, Future Sight. Oh, come on. Sword of the Meek is a two generic mana card for a uncommon artifact equipment. Equip creature gets plus one plus two, but no one cares. Equip for two generic mana, <laughs> no one cares. Whenever a one one creature comes into play under your control, you may return Sword of the Meek from your graveyard to play and attach yep. it to that creature, which if we put the pieces together, yep. All of your mana equals that number of one ones, and the last one gets the sword of the meek stuck on it, and you get to do all of it every turn again and gain all that life in the process. And you banned gain a bunch modern. of life. Yep. Yeah, sword was banned in modern for a long time. Um, it was one of the cards that they've been, uh, you know, Wizards has been slowly unbanning cards and, and seeing how they fit into the current format. And for the most part, they're fine. Um, and this was one of the cards that people were kind of worried about: of is this safe? Is this a good time? And it's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, some people tried to make it happen. It really didn't. Um, and it's it's just fine. I discovered this in the first version of my Sharoom deck. Um, I had this combo in there and it's just dumb. <laughs> if you're playing any sort of aggressive strategy, it just cancels it out. Mm-hmm. Um, don't bother playing an aggro deck because you're never going to win. You're never going to get through the blockers. You're never going to beat the life gain. It's just a nightmare. Right. You just, you just pour all your mana into it every single round. Yep. Exactly. I mean, there's and there are some decks that just can't beat that. Yeah. Um, most decks, if if you get the combo going, and the combo only requires the Thopter Foundry to be in play, mm-hmm. the rest of it is pretty much started once you have that in play and the sword into your graveyard. Mm-hmm. This dominated old extended right before that format died in the Thopter Depths deck that Jerry mm-hmm. Thompson uh, uh, was a champion of, mm-hmm. um, because both there were these both of these were two card combos. <clears throat> Hex Mage with Depths and right. Thopter with Foundry, and one of the combos is gonna kill you. Pretty much, the, 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 when you get to some older formats, sometimes what happens is that you figure out two different ways of like killing you very efficiently, and if you just right. stuck them in the same deck, well, 
well, as long uh, as they kind card, of were. Three card Monty is like that in uh, in Vintage, right? Yeah. Where you just have a bunch of two card combos and hope for the best that you draw that you draw, you know, yeah. two of them. Right, yeah, draw the right you're pieces. Painter, grindstone, helm, rest, helm, ley line, yeah, yeah, all that stuff, yeah. So, and that's sort of what this is, or that what that was rather. Uh, so let's move on here to number seven. Ruben, what's your number seven? All right, this is the one where we might get in a fight. So oh. <clears throat> this right. makes this the, the word on the card <laughs> says it makes a token. Oh no! Now, now it it makes a token. What it makes is a clue token, not a clue, not a not a clue token. It makes a food token. Sorry, food it's a token. token. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. and the food token isn't always a creature, but enough of the time, the food is oh, a no. three three elk. That Why? I needed what? to put Oko Thief of Crown. You basic oh my God. On my list, wrestler. We have Oko, decided Oko is not to be discussed. Oko Thief of Crowns. Uh, for those of you who don't know, oh is a God. colorless, a green, and a blue for a legendary planeswalker, Oko, with lo- starting loyalty of four, as Aaron would say. Why? <laughs> Why? Plus two. Plus two. Oh, my God. Why? <laughs> God. Create a food token. Plus one. Why? <laughs> Plus. Get out of here. Target oh artifact God. or creature. The food. Loses all abilities and becomes a green elk creature with base power and toughness 3-3. Three, three. It also has minus 5. Exchange control of target artifact or creature you control and target creature and opponent controls with power 3 or less. This, of course, dominated every format that it was legal in from the time that it was printed. Um, of course, PV... Uh, um, oh, sorry, Andre Strosky won the Mythic Championship 6 uh, with Simic Control. I mean, it won everything. Um, the it, first weekend it was legal. Yeah. And a vintage challenge, it turned a Black Lotus into an elk and won the game with it. And yeah. I just, there was no time. This the is finals. the best. Yeah, so for those who don't know, this is the best Planeswalker ever made. It's not even yeah. close. It's banned in five formats. Like, they unbanned Jace the Mind Sculptor. He's cool now. This is the dumbest thing ever. Plus wanting and nullifying any creature they play, no matter what it is, is yep. just bananas. And I used to enjoy seeing the screenshots where people would be like, here's a Merit Lage, here's a, here's a Black Lotus, like here are all the things that have been elked. Um, yep. You know, not only did it create new archetypes, but it also breathed life into old archetypes. Um, you had Legacy Miracles that was kind of reeling from the Sensei's Dividing Top thing. You know, they really hadn't found much success. And then it became Bant Miracles between Elk, between Oko and the Coatl. Um, it, it, you know, that became a thing. Oath of Druids had been on the downswing in Vintage. This breathed new life into it because you, before it was you needed Oath of Druids and Forbidden Orchard. Well, now you can turn anything into a creature and you've triggered Oath of Druids. And so um, there's a, a young man named Pingu who's a legacy dredge player who has started running this in his sideboard, one or two copies, and he's posting screenshots of people who think they're playing dredge. And then in game two or three, he slams an Oko and these decks just don't know what to do. And it's hilarious. So stupid. <laughs> this card, like, and it's, this is so one of those stupid. cards that also <laughs> bit players really, really hard. Wizards around the time of Eldraine was just like, yo, dog, uh, we just want to let y'all know um, the brakes are off. And uh, <laughs> we are accelerating up, well, up, we're accelerating up this mountain of the, the power curve as it gets higher. And so we might, you know, might accidentally make everything the, is good now. The yeah. Best thing ever. And so they kind of made the best thing ever. They made a bunch of banned cards once upon a time. How in the world was that a magic card? Right. And you got this guy who just, you know, this, and it also burnt people just financially. This was a card yeah. people bought for $40, sure. $50, like ready. And because it just fell one format after another, he wasn't, Oka wasn't banned in everything all at once. You know, it was like, okay, get him out of standard. Okay, let's right. get him out of pioneer. Okay, let's get him out of modern. Let's get him let, out of. Let him try to solve the problem. Yeah. And the problem was Oko and yeah. it was Baroko and. It's a Oko hell of a, was Broco. Hell of I a remember there. my first game of the Throne of Eldraine streamer early access pre event, which, by the way, join us for the early access streamer event. Th- this comes out after. This comes out Friday, so <laughs> we're only this talking gets about posted. <clears throat> um, whatever. And my first game, I played turn one Gilded Goose, turn two Oko, make a food, and I felt like no one had ever played magic before. Like that was the <laughs> most broken thing anyone had ever done. And it was. You got a Planeswalker at five loyalty with a plus two, a plus one that negates literally anything. Six they loyalty. Play. Six loyalty. 
Yeah, no, yeah, it, it plus twos from the food. Yeah, it's just, it's stupid. So Starts stupid. at four. It's, it's great. Stupid. All right, Aaron, what's number seven? The story that I love to tell about my number seven is I'm one of those people that always has to have the appropriate tokens for whatever I'm playing. And I remember when I built this commander deck, I made sure to pick up like five or six tokens because I just assumed that somebody was going to stop me. I didn't assume that people were going to just let me do this. (laughs) And before I knew it, I had to go back to CoolStuffInc.com and buy myself some more snake tokens because I was all out because nobody bothered to kill Hippatra. (laughs) Uh, my number seven is Hapatra of Zero Poisons. So Hapatra is a black and green. She was originally printed in Amonkhet. She's a legendary creature human cleric. Uh, two power and two toughness. Whenever Hapatra deals combat damage to a player, you may put a minus one, minus one counter on target creature. And then whenever you put one or more minus one, minus one counters on a creature, you get a one, one green snake with death touch. So this is a very early, you're putting, you're playing this on turn two in Commander. A lot of people are still setting up their ramping. It's very easy for you to get in there and kill a Reese or just kill some little 1-1. One, one. Um, and once this thing gets going, it doesn't stop. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've ran out of tokens. You pair this with Carnifex Demon. Yeah. You're going to have a good time. <laughs> You pair this with Incremental Blight. You pair this with Nest of Scarabs. Um, this card has so much synergy with so many cards. Um, you play Overwhelming Stampede, and then all those snakes are really, really big. Not to mention just having Death Touch blockers. Nobody wants to attack into that. Right. Um, and That's so true. this card is so versatile. It gives you a really deadly token strategy. Those tokens can get very big. You're already weakening creatures. You're playing Proliferate, which can get out of hand. Um, but I just had no idea when I first built this deck that how easy it would be to trigger this thing. Um, and just how people just wouldn't know what to do, where they would be like, I don't, I can't. <laughs> I guess you yeah. just have all the tokens. Right. And like, well, no one's going to attack it to me, so yeah. I guess. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. yeah. You know? it's all the stuff that's broken with Hapatra is also super cheap. So you can just do a million things <clears throat> in a turn. Like <laughs> Bowfly Infestation is just three mana, and you just kill everything in play. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, and the art's gorgeous. Shout out to Tyler Jacobson. I remember the first time I saw this, I was in the cafeteria at work, and I just couldn't breathe. Like, I was just like, holy crap. Like, this is just incredible artwork. And she ended up being a bit of a a hero in the war, you know, in the last uh, Hour of Devastation. She was, like, riding the basilisk and, like, saving people. Like, it was awesome. Nice. And this also sort of harkens back uh, to what is almost $13 for Ophiomancer, as this (laughs) makes the green 1-1 Death Touch snake token. Well, Ophiomancer, if you don't know, is a three mana two two that at the beginning of each upkeep, if you control no snakes, you put a one one black snake creature token with death right. touch onto the battlefield. Mike Linneman uh, likes to uh, troll. Um, They've never printed Ethan the Fleischer. E- Where's e- the Ethan snake? Fleischer, thank you so much, <laughs> Ethan. Justice for Oph- Ophiomancer, come on. When they reprint Ophiomancer, which they're going to have to someday. Uh, because it's still a popular card. It's in a lot of cubes, for example. Right. They can put those in the packs. Yeah, very good, very good. This is so, a big favorite of uh, Brian Kelly in Vintage. Um, he loves to main deck this in Vintage. Wow. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have lost to this card as a dredge player because you can't get rid of it, and so it just always has a blocker. <laughs> it's annoying. <laughs> Nice. Well, uh, seeing the these days, my number seven is seeing a lot of play in Pioneer, uh, as it appears. Uh, it still did very well for uh, for years in what looks to be modern events, which was very cool. And this card in standard was just absolutely fantastic. Uh, it showed up in Magic 2015, and they threw it in dual decks, Merfolk versus Goblins. But let me tell you, Goblin Rabble Master is a hell of a magic card. It is a red and two generic mana for a rare 2-2 Goblin Warrior and other Goblin creatures you control attack each turn if able at the beginning of combat on your turn create a 1-1 red Goblin creature token with haste. Whenever Goblin Rabble Master attacks it gets plus one plus zero until end of turn for each other attacking Goblin. I think this is is it three turns they're dead? Are you like three? So it attacks for one then it attacks for six Right. Then it attacks for not no ten. Six. Okay, so four. It's four four turns. Four turns and you're dead. I mean, you've probably dealt them two extra damage with another card in your deck. At some other point. That's not sure. even counting if you have a Foundry Street Denizen or you've you know, you've played um Lightning Bolt. The, Stoke sake. the Flames. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so this card in and of itself just took over standard, was an absolute beast. Uh still seeing lots of play in Pioneer. It is one of the best red threats just ever made, period. Yeah. And it makes tokens nonstop. Yeah, when uh, Legion Warboss came out, people were comparing Legion Warboss to Rabble Master, and 
Legion Warboss is a very, very, very good card. Does yeah. not compare favorably to it Goblin Rabble Master. It still doesn't. Goblin Rabble Master is just a better card because it can attack through a 3 3. Um, and Legion Warboss is also a spectacular magic card, but people just like compare it differently. It's like how Glint Sleeve Siphoner isn't Dark Confidant, but right. both of one Pro Tours, right? Yeah. So, right. you know, we're, we're, it's the context of the environment. Here. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but Goblin Rabble Master, I think the difference is War Boss is cool, but Rabble Master is explosive. Yes. If you don't contain this thing right now, it's going mm-hmm. to get bananas in like two turns, and you have to stop that from happening. And that's yep. why I think it's super exciting. All right, let's move on here to number six. Aaron, what's number six? You can't know where you're going <clears throat> until you know where you've been. So uh, before Golgari Grave Troll was unbanned and before we got toys like, you know, Prized Amalgam and Cathartic Reunion, uh, we had this card. And so the earliest versions of Modern Dredge uh, was more of a loam strategy. You were playing Life from the Loam. You were playing this card, my number six. Um, and you were playing a really, really grindy game. You were playing Flame Jab. Um, you were playing Lingering Souls. It was this almost four color deck and you would grind your opponents down until they were like those little pencils that you would use at the library to mm-hmm. write down your Dewey Decimals. Oh, you turned them um, into nubs? Nubs. Yes. Um, and this card helped me do it. Um, it. It's a lot of fun. Um, my number six is Zombie Infestation. Mm. Um, so Zombie Infestation is one colorless and a black. It was originally printed in Odyssey, which was great for zombies, by the way. Um, it's an enchantment. It says discard two cards from your hand. That's instant speed. And put a 2-2 black zombie creature token into play. So you could discard a Vengeful Pharaoh. <laughs> Um, you could also loop this with Golgari Brown Scale. Burn yep. decks would just scoop on the spot because you're just dredging and drawing, dredging, and then pitching it and making more zombies. Um, your zombies get really, really big. You're grinding them out with discard and lingering souls. Um, and this was really, the, you know, the card that did it all. It always makes sure that you have a dredger. It's also a decent answer if they do have graveyard hate because you can just play a fair game right. and just make a bunch of 2 2 zombies. And so, um, I have a lot of love for this card. Uh, nobody really plays Zombie Loam anymore. Um, but this is really the card that got modern dredge started and and when you look back at the work that you know raf levy did he was one of the first people to really pick this deck up um you know into lishi tian and zen takahashi and all of them this is the card that got everybody started april 13th which is to the day as we record this 2002 18 years ago (gasps) one david humphreys got third to i guess third or fourth place doesn't say Ah! here at pro tour new orleans in 2000 well, to their 2001 or whatever. The I guess. Dave Humphreys. The yeah. Dave Humphreys, the one that's right now in uh, in R&D. <laughs> uh, this was a reanimator deck that reanimated yeah. stuff like Avatar of Woe oh. and Multani, Marrow Sorcerer <clears throat> yep. from back in the day. And Verdant Force has a Verdant Force in here. It's running Great. four Re-animator zombie Verdant infestation. Force. That's it's amazing. Awesome. So I think that's terrific uh, and the sign of a fantastic card. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Aaron, I'm sorry, Ruben, what is your number six? No, my number six, if if uh, Aaron is going to appeal to my sensibilities with Boros tokens, I can appeal to her sensibilities with Vintage. Now, you haven't maybe played a ton of Monastery Mentor in Vintage, mm-hmm. but it is an all-star in that format. Uh, and it is my number six. Monastery Mentor, two colorless and a white for a human monk. It is restricted in Vintage now. Mm-hmm. Thank God. It is a 2-2 two, two with really prowess, nice. and when you cast a non-creature spell, create a Mox Ruby uh, token. Right. One, one, <laughs> one, 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 one white monk creature token with prowess. It's my it's my token that I got made with the, the with the Teferi art yes. uh, from our from our thing. And it's originally, of course, from Fate Reforged, and there are uh, Judge gift card versions of them now. Um, yeah, the Monastery Miracles decks, the Monastery just combo decks in Vintage and Legacy, uh, really reimagined actually Miracles in Legacy as mm-hmm. you could sort of put people on a clock kind of out of nowhere with Monastery Mentor and then you would go like, you know, brainstorm top force a will and then you just have an army. Um, and of course, illustrated by Magali. And uh, yeah, just a just a all star the in the older formats didn't really do a ton in standard, but like a sideboard card at best. Yeah, all yeah. star, all star in the old formats. Yeah, I mean you forget that prowess includes artifacts. So when you're when you're playing a format with Moxin, 
Mm-hmm. You know, you can just drop a bunch of moxin. You can also do the trick where you loop Sensei's Divining Tops. You just whoop, 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 and you're getting prowess triggers, and then your creatures are getting bigger. Um, this is the sole win condition of a lot of decks, the paradoxical outcome decks. You loop a bunch of outcomes, you play a bunch of dumb things, you return them all to your hand, you then redeploy them, and you rack up those triggers. Um, and so this is the card that they will stall for, and, and this is what they use to win. The Jeskai decks love this. The, the outcome mm-hmm. decks love it. Um, like you said, it was great in Miracles, because Miracles had a really hard time closing out games for a while there Um, and so they needed a way to just kind of game two or game three all right let's wrap this baby up and people would board out a lot of their removal because you're playing miracles you know and then you would just die to this and and like a lot of broken cards you don't even have to go ham with it like yes you can make 16 monks and have them all be 17 17s but sometimes just making two or three Or even just killing the mentor, but leaving those monks. Those monks have prowess too. I can't tell you how many times I've dealt with the mentor and lost to the residuals because you just can't keep up with it. And so you can go ham. You don't have to. It's powerful anyway. You slice it. I mean, Monastery Mentor also had an incredible judge gift card in 2019, Mm -hmm. uh, which is absolutely beautiful. Uh, Prowess was a ability that wizards tried really hard to make sort of, if not vanilla, you know, this for their evergreen. This was the, this is what blue had. Has, right green has trample and black has death touch and white has vigilance or life right. link and blah 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 and we'll have prowess prowess will be a thing and eventually they're like okay prowess was whatever we're gonna move on to a post prowess world i like yeah. prowess i like a prowess lot. Too. <clears throat> i don't for what it's worth i don't dislike prowess that much um but right. i can also understand it can get kind of samey after a while to see you know, oh do i check sure. for the prowess trigger check for the prowess trigger forever on every i don't know it gets samey but i also think it gives It gave something new to certain colors that didn't have that. Like, how many times was white caring about non-creature spells? White's always been the sort of the white weenie color. You know, blue has always been the play very few creatures, you know, and play a bunch of counter spells. So that played very well with that. You know, red, look at what it did for Monastery Mentor. Or look at the, you know, the Soul Scar Mage. You know, it gave a different dimension to red, too. And so, you know, I do agree that it's very familiar. Like, it's not terribly spicy. But I think it added something to, you know, the three colors that it was in and and i i really like it yeah there you go well uh my number six is multiple colors we're talking about multiple colors uh had a sort of stole the show of uh of a cast of characters that we had uh been been waiting to look and and meet with and hang out with and go back to the world that they inhabited um this is a card that I loved in Limited. It was absolutely brilliant. It was super duper powerful because there was no set. And I'm just telling you right now, the best set ever made. Go get your booster boxes, throw them in a closet. You can sell them for a whole bunch of money a long time from now. The best magic set ever made is Dominaria, okay? And Dominaria had Slimefoot, the mm-hmm. stowaway, and he is the business. Yeah, that's right. Adam Staborski got to play Slimefoot, I believe. Is that correct? In yep. your Adam Staborski. This was so Wedge <laughs> was scheduled to play um, Slimefoot in my board, the Weatherlight campaign, but of course had yeah. his back issue at GP Vegas, and so Stibbs stepped in at the last moment and did a fabulous job. Uh, you can catch a vid, a vod of B- board the Weatherlight from that um, on the Saving Throw Show website. There you go. Slimefoot the Stowaway is a green, a black, and a generic mana for a 2-3 uncommon legendary fungus. Hell yeah. Whenever a sapperling you control dies, Slimefoot the Stowaway deals one damage to each opponent and you gain one life. For four generic generic mana colon, you create a 1-1 green sapperling creature token. So it had very good stats. I mean, fine stats, three mana for a 2-3, which is good. But that ability, you could keep crunching out these sapperlings to just overrun your opponent or just to just kind of ping them to death. You'd be like, okay, mm-hmm. I'll Chump it, take one, chump it, take Don't one. eat the baby. Don't eat the baby. Don't eat the baby. Don't eat the baby. And just a really beloved character. You know, Denom- Dominari was one of those sets that had all of these exciting, like, here's to fairy. Right. Here's Karn. And what do people care about? Slimefoot, Slimefoot. and Yargle. <laughs> Slimefoot and Yargle. <laughs> you know, and I remember the story. You know, this was such a unique character because Slimefoot didn't talk. Correct. And so I remember mm-hmm. the the article or the the blurb. This is back when they wrote stories. Remember those? Mm-hmm. Um, and you got to see this. You got uh-huh. to see it from Slimefoot's perspective. And it was really all just, like, thoughts so of, like, what's... Is- Return to Dominaria episode 10 by Martha Wells is the one you're talking about. And it yeah. is one of my favorite magic stories. And you got to hear about how Slimefoot started as just a bud that just kind of attached itself to, you know, the wood of the weatherlight and grew into this thing. Um, the way that it sort of keeps track of its young or the way that it, you know, it expands or it spawns. Mm-hmm. Just a fascinating character. And and I hope we I hope we get to see more of them somehow. I don't... I, there's For me, there's no way... They go back to Dominaria, and you don't see Slimefoot and Yargle again 
in some form or fashion. It's just gotta happen. Look, yeah. we went back to Ravnica and we got like multiple Fabolthup references. Yeah. So if you're gonna do that with Ravnica, we're gonna have a lot of slime feet. We're gonna have multiple Yarglies. Look, um, Wizards knows that you lean into the memes. You, you lean know, right in. We know where our bread is bargled. And our bread <laughs> is bargled by Slargle. Slime foot the stove. Wall. You gotta put one slime foot in front of the other. Just oh first. my god. Let's move on here to number five. Uh, Ruben, what's your number five? My number five, for a while, held the record of, I, it might still hold the record of most individual words on a creature. There are 95 words in the text boxes alone of this creature. Now, to be fair, it has two text boxes because it's a werewolf and it flips and it's Huntmaster of the Fells. Nice. Mm. Huntmaster of the Fells is a 2-2 for two colorless red-green originally from Dark Ascension. Whenever this creature enters the battlefield or transforms into Huntmaster of the Fells, you create a 2-2 wolf creature token and you gain two life. At the beginning of each upkeep, if no spells were cast last turn, transform Huntmaster of the Fells into... Ravager of the Fells, which instead of being a human werewolf, is just a werewolf. It has trample, and whenever this creature transforms into Ravager of the Fells, it deals two damage to target opponent or planeswalker, and two damage to up to one target creature that player or that planeswalker's controller controls. At the beginning of each upkeep, if a player cast two or more spells last turn, transform Ravager of the Fells. It's a lot of words. And actually, that was the new updated wording since yeah. we've changed the Planeswalker redirection rule to have even more words than it used to. So it's it's a lot. But this could be an, a token engine. You could turn on, you could make a wolf factory out of this yeah. if you had a turn with no spells and then the next turn you played two creatures and flipped it back over and, re, and, and made more spells. wolves uh. and more triggers and more whatever. Oh, Ruben, you're tatering on us. I got too excited about werewolves. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a bit of a haymaker, and this is a a, a a a this was in the modern gen decks for a long time. Certainly was in the standard gen decks because yes. this is a card that could really run away with games, and this is also a card that you can manipulate. You know, you can play it so that you know you're flipping it or you're flipping it back, and you because you can choose that, um, it makes it really really powerful. You know, it's great against aggressive decks. It's great when you need to turn the corner. Um, you know, just an awesome awesome card, and really showcase the power. Power of transform. Yep. And people completely underestimated it. And mm-hmm. I mean, not just like a little, like this was, <laughs> if not a crap mythic, which is like a whatever, you know, it was four or five people, bucks because people didn't get it. Yeah. Back in the day, as, as we, we just call it the day back then. And uh, when you would show up to a pro tour, you didn't show your list. Now you have to upload your list like a week and a half earlier or whatever and, yeah. and tell God and everybody about it, which is what you're doing <laughs> before you even sit down That's and right. get to play a game of magic cards. Well, back in the day, you're still scribbling stuff out whenever. And because what, no one talked about Hunt Master of the Fells, and then it was the pro tour, pro tour Dark Ascension, and then everybody was playing it. It was four of and like everything. And yeah. so everyone lost their minds. And so there, I guess at some point, Wizards put it together the fact that, you know, even if they there is a surprise deck at the Pro Tour that's not going to sell them more booster packs. So they're right. like, well, why don't you just give us a deck list early and we'll do some, you know, pre-work and whatnot, uh, which is something that coverage always struggled with back in the day. Like it right. was a huge struggle uh, to get that information. But Huntmaster of the Spells is a fantastic creature. It, it then ran standard for as long as it was in it yep. uh, because the rate was just absolutely terrific. So you had to get used to knowing, well, they're going to play their Huntmaster on this turn, and you're going to play your Huntmaster, and they're going to try to go back and forth, and flip yours or flip theirs, and blah, 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 blah. It was a whole thing for like a year. All right. Let's move on here to Aaron, which is number five. The only thing I love as much as dead things are enchantments. And uh, my number five has been, uh, I won my first ever game day partially on the back of this card. Um, I've tried to make this work in Pioneer. You don't really need it in the older formats if you're playing any sort of enchantress strategy. But if you're playing, if you're playing standard, you're playing modern, or you're playing Pioneer, you do need this to close out games. It's stupid easy to trigger. It's great for turning the corner. My number five is Sigil of the Empty Throne. Mm -hmm. Um, So Sigil of the Empty Throne is three colorless and two white. It was originally printed in Conflux. Um, it is an enchantment, and it says whenever you cast an enchantment spell, you get a 4-4 four, four white angel token with flying. The spell doesn't even have to resolve. Yeah. You can just... <laughs> I can't tell you how many times it's like, that's a chalice? Uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> 
because you get a four cares, four. Yeah, and so exactly. um, this is a really great way for enchantment decks to go big and to go wide. Um, you know, a lot of times they're having to just kind of survive the early turns. But once you get to the mid to late game, a lot of decks can't deal with just a bunch of four fours. And, you know, enchantment's going to be very cheap. So you're just playing things you don't even care about. You're like, ah, oh, yeah, it's a mana bloom. How about that? Like you just, you know, you don't even care because you're getting a four four out of the deal. And so um, just a really, really great card. Brings me a lot of happiness. And uh, I love the art too. It's beautiful. Recently, Wizard. they added uh, Sigil of the Empty Throne to Historic on yeah. Magic Arena. I Love played. It. I've been playing a lot of Historic, mostly mono green Stompy, but I got stomped myself by a Sigil of the Empty Throne deck that was playing like Ixlon's Bindings and Ashiox Erasures and Omen of the Sea yes. and a oh bunch of God. just random garbage. Oh, and I was like, "What? Awesome. Why does your d- you have just got a million <laughs> Banishing Lights? And what is happening?" <laughs> that would get me on historic the table and i was like oh there's a sigil of the empty throne that would get me to play historic wizards likes to print this thing my god it was in plane chase it was in origins it was in commander it was in the plane chase anthology and then they stuck it in historic because they're like hey do something funny there i don't know go (laughs) go weird be be strange it's fine uh (laughs) speaking of white enchantments at number five goodness Mm -hmm. gracious this is another one that could kind of be you know is this uh is is this like is this right for this list? Are we talking only about creatures? Because, you know, maybe something turns it into a creature later. Maybe oh, no. this is one of the most beloved oh. enchantments in white that showed up in the past two years. It's already almost worth like $9 because everybody who plays Commander and they play white cards needs a copy of Smothering Tithe. Ooh. Smothering Tithe is a white and three generic mana enchantment is a rare from Ravnica Allegiance. And whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two generic mana. If the player doesn't, you create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap. Sacrifice this artifact, add one mana of any color. It's just everyone loves this card. Curse yeah. is infinite play. It's basically an auto include. If you're playing white and commander, you're probably playing this card because white does not have great ramp options. Um, and so this card gets out of hand very quickly. You also get to turn into Ristic Studies guy of like pay two. Pay two, yeah. sir. Pay would you two. like to pay two? Yeah. Um, you mm-hmm. get to be that person. Um, you know, people are drawing more than one card a lot in Commander. And so this is a really great way to... Um, it's also artifacts. If you're playing anything that c- cares about artifacts, you now have artifacts for affinity or for improvise or things like that. Um, you know, this is just a really, really great card. And I, I remember I bought mine... I bought mine at a GP because we've all played GPs where you have like a weird number of those, those prize tickets. Yep. Yep. And like you're just kind of going through and you're like, well, I don't need any more sleeves because Lord knows I bought enough boxes of sleeves Mm -hmm. with these prize tickets. And I remember just going through the singles case and being like, you know what? And this was back when they were like five dollars. And I was like, yeah, just I'll just take like a smothering time. You know, just give me two. And now they're like ten dollars. And it's like, there we go. (laughs) Stuck in the finance game. Right. That's right. (laughs) Things I just did, things I bought to kill time. (laughs) Smothering tithe is my favorite answer to Nickel Bolas, the 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 dragon god. Um, because they plus it and you draw a card and have to sacrifice a permanent. You're just like, oh, you drew a card? Yeah. But you tapped out for that, right? So I'll just sacrifice this treasure. Mm-hmm. Weird, weird how that works. Womp yeah. womp. Yeah, that's fantastic. This card just got tons of love. And I, I can imagine that Wizards is going to, if not design cards like it, certainly yeah. make white do different, weirder stuff. Uh, well, the white, the taxes side of white Mm-hmm. is really kind of still unexplored design space. Mm-hmm. It's true. Um, you know, the, the Ristic Study style, Smothering Tithe style effects, um, things, and, and you also have things like Tithe Taker and Eidolon of Obstruction, but that's a different kind of thing. This, right. where you get a reward and you make your opponent choose between the lesser of two evils, really there's a lot more room here. Yeah, but you got to be careful to not just turn it into a straight Punisher mechanic because then sure. you get Tribute as the mechanic, which well, is yeah, absolutely miserable. Um, so that sucked, but it's all good. Let's move on here to number four. Uh, mine is my only hire, so we'll talk about it in a little bit. Ruben, what's your number four? My number four is higher on someone else's list. All right, Aaron, what is your number four? My number four was a card that I loved in Standard. And you know I don't play Standard very often, but this was enough to get me playing Standard. Um, I loved this deck. I was so sad when it rotated. Um, It wasn't good enough for Modern. People have tried to make it a thing in Pioneer, but it just isn't. Um, I have recently given it a new home in my Sharoom EDH deck, um, where I love it and it makes the games go on for... I can't even just... It's so good. 
sorry. It makes me so happy. Um, my number four is God Pharaoh's Gift. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yes. This I love it card. so much. So God Pharaoh's Gift is seven colorless mana, and it was originally printed in Hour of Devastation. Uh, it's an artifact. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you may exile a creature card from your graveyard. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that card, except it is a black 4-4 four, four black zombie. It gains haste until end of turn. So you could play this when in standard you played a white blue deck and you would play some sacred cats and you would just kind of throw it in front of something you know get your little one life and it comes back as a four four black cat zombie so it takes little insignificant creatures and suddenly makes them really really big threats um it also gives creatures with etb triggers another chance uh, another bite at that apple yep. um it's it's just at the beginning of combat which is really really cool these creatures have haste so they're getting in there um this is just a really exciting card i love playing this i love doing things with like Clark clan ironworks where you sacrifice your crappy little mirrors and then they come back <laughs> so, i'm sorry i just love this card so much and i'm so glad that my shroom deck works um this was also a big story reveal because a lot of people really wondered what bolus's plan was on amonkhet we knew that people were dying they weren't making it through the trials we knew that something was happening afterwards but this really cemented it um no pun intended um that they were being coded in lazatap and then turned into the eternals and so big aha moment great card um i just i just adore it you know, if they're going to make dirtily seven drop artifacts, <laughs> okay, I'm here for that. Like, I'm yeah. fine if that's your end game is this crazy seven mana artifact thing <laughs> versus these two cards that all cost, that cost like one half or whatever mana yeah. and just blow up in your face. Like, okay, you paid seven, you put yeah. creatures in your graveyard, you yeah, check you the put, boxes. You put four Minister of Impediments in your standard Well, there deck. was a goblin version too, Ruben. True, that played there a was. lot of the, because you play a bunch of crappy. Yep. Yeah, you played the, the fanatical firebrand, you'd play mm -hmm. these crappy little red goblins, sure and all of a did. sudden you transition to the late game and then. Yep. Card so you either you either try to ramp into it with Skirk Prospector and Goblin Instigator, or you try to discard it and refurbish it, or, or you, you just do, pay seven Let's or gate to the retail. afterlife. Yeah. yeah, gate to the afterlife was another one. Exactly, yeah, this... I had that in my Itali Brawl deck. Yes, to gate to the afterlife for my God Pharaoh's <laughs> gift. This one uh, Grand Prix Singapore in 2018 was blue Absolutely. white God Pharaoh's gift. That was a thing that you can do. Uh, all right, so let's move on here to number three. Ruben, what's your number three? My number three is a, I mean, when you say tokens card, this is probably the most dominant tokens card for its time to the point where it was banned in its block format and got another card banned in its block format because Lingering Souls was so powerful. Yeah, it was. It got Intangible Virtue banned. Like, Intangible Virtue was probably fine once you got rid of Lingering Souls. Mm -hmm. Lingering Souls is so good, Jund started splashing white a for Lingering Souls. Yeah. yeah. God. So Lingering Souls is two colorless and a white, originally from Dark Ascension, second Dark Ascension entry on our list, for my list. Put two 1-1 one, one white spirit tokens with flying onto the battlefield, and it has flashback of a colorless and a black. Which means so, you may, go ahead. I'm sorry? Oh, which means you may cast this card from your graveyard for its flashback cost, and you exile it. Indeed, yes. Go ahead. Um, this card was all over the place. I mean, it was in Esper Stoneblade in Legacy. It was in Hoof There It Is for a <laughs> second there. Gifts Control, Jund, Reanimator, oh, yeah. Tokens, Solar Flare. Uh, I mean, you name it, it was in the, a deck with Lingering Souls. Yep. Um, the story that I've heard goes something along the lines of originally it flashed back for two colorless and a black. And I think Zach Hill was the one who was like, why don't we, why don't we make it a colorless and a black? And uh, then they did. And then Lingering Souls happened. And mm -hmm. it's like the definition of fair magic, right? Like it's four tokens at sorcery speed across two castings. Like how bad is it? Well, it turns out those tokens have evasion. Those tokens can stand and can like just run a clock. Those tokens can be spread out over multiple turns. They can be cast from graveyards. It's It just does all of the right things. It used to give affinity fits. Like affinity. Yeah, like you, affinity. you think of modern affinity. Pour one out for modern affinity because you know no one's playing her anymore. Yeah. But I remember back in the day, that was a good enough card. You would just throw it in front of the ink moss where it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll just I'll just put a cranial plating on it. It's like that's nice. You still only got one toughness, so yeah. whoop. <laughs> you just had 
blockers for days. You know, they had no way to really punch through that. Um, it's a win condition. It's just good in every type of deck. If you want to play an aggressive strategy with it and go kind of black white tokens, you can. If you want to go a mid range strategy like a Jundi, you discard it to your Lilianas of the Veils and you get your value. You discard it to your zombie infestations. You're fine discarding it. Um, it buys you time if you're just trying to throw chump blockers in front of it. You can play it as a control strategy. You play four snapcasters in this. Right. You got yourself some win conditions, baby. Yeah, and oftentimes it was used in a whole variety of ways. Now, uh, me and Ruben are on the same wavelength. This was my number four. The thing okay. that was higher was Lingering Souls. Lingering Souls is just one of the best token creators of all time. It's it's one of those where, again, it doesn't read all that amazing. Yeah, it doesn't it's, read broken. It's okay. It's fine. I don't know. It's just, but no, like it, where it needs to be in the game, the idea mm-hmm. that you can run a board sweeper and then make some tokens and say go, the back end of it being only two mana was a big deal, even if the front is three, or so you can just mill it in your graveyard, then you have a really cheap way to make tokens. Right. Uh, this thing was dumb, and yeah, it, it got cards banned. It was the only thing, like when they said to play Innistrad Block, you were like, um, which Lingering Souls deck would you like to play? Right, exactly. <laughs> Because that's what your format is. So Intangible Virtue had to go. Uh, But yeah, Lingering Souls is fantastic. Definitely worthy of the top five, in my opinion. Aaron, what's number three? My number three is another one of those haymakers that the Jun decks really, really love. Um, This card was a dominant force in Standard. Um, It has gone on to see a lot of play in Modern. It's currently going for $20 plus, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, This was the return of a character from Zendikar. Um, The artwork is amazing. Um, There was a really great storyline for this character, too. Uh, My number three... Three. Three. Numbers are hard. Uh, I picked it up from you guys. I was doing so well. Uh, My number three is Kalidus, Traitor of Get. So Kalidus is uh, from Oath of the Gatewatch. He is two colorless and two black. Legendary creature, vampire warrior uh, with three power and four toughness. He has lifelink. If a non-token creature an opponent controls would die, you exile that card instead and put a 2-2 black zombie creature token onto the battlefield. And then you can pay two colorless and a black to sacrifice another vampire or zombie and put two plus one plus one counters on Kalitas. So if you're just playing a fair black green game, which is known for sort of this one for one removal, you know, you slam Kalitas on turn five or six, you want him in more of the mid or late game and you just go to town and you can sacrifice the zombies to Kalitas to make him bigger. If you need to recoup some life or if you need to win the life gain game, um, you can also just go wide if you need to, but you really don't even need to do anything other than just play magic. You're doing what a black deck already does. There's also some nice graveyard hate there if you're you know trying to make sure things don't come back the artwork is amazing uh Kalidus comes from the get which is the vampire case that worked with the eldrazi um and volunteered themselves to sort of be taken over by you know the eldrazi and you see sort of the spikes coming out of him and you see the thing on his head um and so just a really creepy character really great art very powerful card um saw a lot of play in standard still sees play in modern um and it's easy to see why it's just a great card yeah it's seeing play that you know and that's how you can tell it's a great card it's in the sideboard of the esper control decks and its main board in the mono black aggros so it's good on both ends of the spectrum this card was fantastic in standard i'm not surprised it's 26 freaking dollars as of right yeah. now um this card just runs high on rate essentially yeah. uh there was a point and <laughs> we're going to get to that in just a second where wizards had gotten like this the, the the power spikes of the mythics around that time were just huge like they were just this this is miles better than what you could do at four mana in black yeah. at that time and it wasn't right. even close I mean, this is this is oftentimes the four the go to four drop in Jund mm-hmm. in modern instead of Huntmaster instead of an, a, a Johnny or whatever other thing you're doing. It's, it does everything. It has it has life link. It has four toughness. It makes tokens. It is grave hate. It can be in its own engine. It just does everything. It does everything. Well, let me tell you what uh, there was for my number three. There was a set right before that one. It was called Battle for Zendikar. And see, like, this year, we're going back to Zendikar so they can do the Zendikar we wanted, which was Indiana Jones right. World, As not weird, to, squiggly, fiddly right. bit boys. As but, opposed to Battle for Eldrazi. Yeah, Battle for, you know, uh, Eldritch Horror or whatever. Yeah. Um, which is fine, because I'm excited. But sure. it also means that when you go back and you look at Battle for Zendikar, Wizards, like, 
I don't know exactly why, but they're like, look, we're going to show you one of the cards from Battles in the Car. It's going to be the best card from the set, not even close. You're going to see this card in non-stop decks from the moment it's legal to the moment it leaves. Gideon, ally of Zendikar, was just frigging everywhere. It was everywhere. It was just dumb how good this card was in yep. relation to everything else. It's two white, two generic mana for a four loyalty mythic planeswalker. Gideon, of course, for it has a plus one of until end of turn. Gideon, ally of Zendikar, becomes a 5-5 five, five human soldier ally creature with indestructible. That's still a planeswalker prevent all damage that would be dealt to him this turn zero colon zero colon mm -hmm. create a plus a two two white knight ally creature token and for minus four colon which means you can pop this the instant you play it you get an emblem with creatures you control get plus one plus one so you got the crusade emblem you got the two two that could be a three three if you play another one of this copy mm -hmm. of this guy or you plus one smash in for five and the next turn you minus four and then you have a crusade token with gideon still <laughs> making dudes next turn this car i'm telling you it was just uh, dumb uh, it was dumb Gideon Allies out of cards, absurd. Cards it done. was, for, for a four-mana Planeswalker, it saw play in the Legacy sideboards because mm -hmm. Miracles wanted something to do out of the sideboard um, <laughs> that could put pressure on and making a 2-2 two -two every turn, well, you could do worse than that. Yeah. Um, Gideon Allies of Zendikar won a Pro Tour, at least one Pro Tour, um, mm -hmm. and it was just all over the place. People started playing Dragon Lord Silumgar just yes. to steal Gideon's and, <laughs> and you'd sack it sack immediately. It immediately. <laughs> sack it immediately, that's right. So that you could be like, ha ha, uh, well, I have a 5-7 now, I guess. Yeah. Because I have an emblem on my side. Oh, that's a dumb one. It was ridiculous. It was in Death and Taxes. It was in White Blue Control. It was in Mardu Vehicles, was a was the huge deck for it most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, anything from Mardu to Stoneblade to Bant Snowblade to, I mean, like. Anything that could, ha anything that could reliably have two white men on turn four. Literally anything that could reliably have two white man on turn four play yeah. this card. Yeah, when you had five colored mana bases to play whatever you wanted, you played four of this guy. It mm. was ridiculous. All right, let's move on here to number two. Aaron, what's number two? My number two uh, is good enough to see legacy play and modern play. Uh, it is a win condition in one of my favorite decks. Um, you know, obviously I love my storm count 10 decks or my storm level. The storm scale is what Maro has to uh, rate how broken strategies are. And there are only two strategies at the top of the storm scale. That is dredge and storm. Um, and you can't really talk about storm without talking about this card. I'm going to produce empty the Warrens. Yep. Um, so empty the Warrens is three colorless and a red. It is a sorcery uh, originally printed in time spiral um, and it's very simple it just says put two one one red goblin creature tokens into play now for four mana you might think that's not very great but um, you play this with a, it has storm <laughs> So if you just cast a bunch of crappy cards before it, like some Lotus Petals, uh, maybe some Dark Rituals, and this thing gets out of hand very, very quickly. Um, this is another way that Storm can win if they can't necessarily tendrils you out. Um, if you happen to slam a Leyline of Sanctity, that's fine. They'll just make 10 goblins and they'll kill you with them. Um, you can also run this in Belcher. This is a backup win condition for Belcher if they can't win with the Belcher itself. Well, again, they'll just make a bunch of mana with their Tinder Walls and their things like that, and they'll get an empty of the Warrens, and, and they'll beat you down with several tokens. Um, I have this in my Pashalik Mons deck. I'm trying that out for a little bit and so be sacrificing some goblins, but just a fantastic card. So much fun. Um, and I always love seeing how high people can go with this. So like, how many are we looking at? And then just watching them all. <laughs> Yeah. It's just it's just great. Yeah, for those who don't know what Storm, it says whenever you play this spell, you copy it for each spell played before <laughs> it this turn. That that ability is so stupid. Yeah. Wizards stupid, was like Wizards was like ability. Okay. Wizards is like we did Storm, right? It's stupid ability. It's crazy stupid. We're gonna do it again and the rates are gonna be terrible. And it didn't matter. <laughs> it didn't matter. Everything was the busted green one, and broken. Whether the storm is a win condition it's nowadays. Over, yeah. Like yeah, it, it, legacy. There was a legacy storm version with either flux reservoir. Wow! Oh my god! Because you don't care, Amazing. you'll gain a bunch of life and you'll blow someone's face off. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. This was my <laughs> number eight. Nice. Um, it is banned in pauper because yes. everything with storm is broken. <laughs> yes. Um, even ground rift, <clears throat> the unplayable red target mm -hmm. creature can't block storm card was playable in the niv magus elemental decks um storm is just a completely unreasonable ability empty the warrens is a 
just a, it's a, I mean, among Storm cards, it's not unfair. It's just that Storm is unfair. And never forget. Hashtag never forget. Yeah. They, they put Storm in Walmart. Storm in Walmart. They put Storm <laughs> It's good. In Get the, start them off young. Yeah. I, I, it, 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 it helps you with your counting. It helps you with your, your memory because you have to keep track of your Storm. I, I think it's beautiful. I, I. I, I'm, yep. I'm an you know, everyone else over there with plastic little guns. Like, here's baby's first Uzi. <laughs> right. Here you go. It also, it also helps you with your history. Well, you can't play cowboys who... and Indians anymore because that's not okay. So go put a storm deck in so their hands. Go play elves versus goblins. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Terrific. <laughs> Is Ruben. it first cold diary? Right. Ruben, what's your number two? My number two. Now, Gideon's good. Gideon was in my top five. But for my money, the planeswalker that makes tokens that is the best planeswalker for making tokens of all time it's not close and going from uh, empty the warrens which was a broken busted magic card to like one of the most fair cards like everyone knew that it was great everyone knew that it was amazing but it was never close to being like are they gonna ban it no it just won three pro tours as the main win condition and was just always a solid, solid planeswalker. My number two is Elspeth Sun's Champion. Mm-hmm. Elspeth Sun's Champion is four colorless white, white, originally from Theros. It was also the uh, Elspeth from the dual decks, Elspeth versus Kiora. Mm. Plus one, create three, one, one white soldier creature tokens. Minus three, destroy all creatures with power, four or greater. Minus seven, you get an emblem with creatures you control, get plus two, plus two, and flying, and it had a starting loyalty of four. This was the uh, uh, this was in the Abzan mid-range deck that Seth Manfield used to win Worlds in 2015. This was in Ari Lax's Abzan mid-range deck that he won Pro Tour Cons of Tarkir with. And, of course, Patrick Chapin's junk deck at Pro Tour Journey into Nyx uh, was, was, had this as well. This card is ridiculous. This is one of those cards that really kind of sneaks up on you because you're like, it's six man. That's six a man. lot of man. Exactly. Like in the older formats, you, you should just win the game on the spot or whatever. And standard, we'd never seen, I think at the time, something that had been like sort of that expensive. You'd be on yeah. like, you know, Karn or something from New yeah. Phyrexia. Um, you know, it had been a while. And plus one, make three tokens uh, that's just a wall like you have to be lucky to get through with anything after you plus one and get right. three tokens and then deal enough damage deal five damage to actually get her off the board right. it was ridiculous and, and you don't want to try to break through with anything too big because exactly. she'll just reprisal it then yep. and then because that destroys just, uh, all the creatures yeah with just cast re- retribution of the meek to destroy your storm breath dragons your yep. palucronoses whatever what have you you yep. need to stay under that level uh but still be able to get through it was it's a wild wild card yeah. still is. he's playing modern to this day usually in the control deck sideboards because you'd be surprised how many decks in modern just can't deal with the no spell <laughs> I do like the fact, and I'm sure this is, I'm I'm biased as hell. I don't care. Get over it. I like Dominaria, all right? I love that <laughs> set. I love everything about it. I love More than Kamigawa? It. Yeah. I, I think oh, Dominaria oh. is just, okay. it's the best magic set ever made. Everything, it checks every box I can imagine as a magic player. And this card in particular, listen, right now, as we live and breathe, April 2020, get your copies of this card if you like it in any way. This card's been worth a million dollars in a couple years. It's already on its way up. It's already like six bucks. Um, and just a rare. So when I first played Dominaria and I first got my hands on a little card called Helm of the Host, I was like, mother of God, this card <laughs> is insane. This yeah. card is nuts. I can copy anything it's equipped to. Even if it's a legend, it's not a legend. I, it, you put this yeah. on a ham sandwich and in seven <laughs> turns, it's over. you yeah. got seven ham sandwiches and the game's over. It it's doesn't matter. Sandwiches. I watched somebody uh, win with Skittering Surveyor. It just, don't matter. The helm of the host. You're, you're thinning your deck. You're mm-hmm. getting lands. My favorite story I love to tell with this card was I was playing a commander game at GP Minneapolis and I stole somebody's helm of the host um and then i also reanimated their i used animate dead on their elish norn oh my god and i just started making multiple elish norns 
Helm of the Host is... <laughs> that anthem effect. It's dumb. It's crazy. Helm of the Host is a four generic mana for a rare legendary artifact equipment. At the beginning of combat on your turn, create a token that's a copy of equipped creature, except the token isn't legendary. If equipped creature is legendary, that token gains haste. So it equips for five generic mana. So for you know, turn four, you play it. Turn five, you equip it. Doesn't matter what it's stuck on. And in Limited, this thing was just like the never-ending bomb of bombs. I've yeah. never lost a game where I've resolved and equipped oh, yeah. this card it's just dumb i can't yeah. i can't yeah i uh i lost this in arena cube sealed on a roalesque mm-hmm. recently because <laughs> one roalesque would put two new counters on the other roalesque yeah it's cool to think of you know well you know all right so we're, we're in our super spike value mode right well, okay well you're paying nine mana before you get anything out of it and then you know sort of timmy is just like holy god what happens at the end of the nine mana rainbow yeah. is that the helm of the host explodes and you just get to yep. run over with everything it's fantastic mm-hmm. i love that card absolutely yep. terrific let's move on here to number one which is one that I share with Mr. Ruben. But first, let's hear from Aaron about what her number one is. I think I know what our <laughs> all three of our number ones are going to be. I mean, so, uh, we've come one... this far, Evan. <laughs> so the one thing that my numbers two through ten all have in common um, is, is they have this, this little problem. They have this little catch to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that catch is you have to actually cast them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But what if it was a card that you didn't even have to cast? I mean, you can. It won't do anything, but you can. There's a mana cost on it. Um, But for those of us who don't want to be bothered with all that mess, my number one's Bridge from Below. (laughs) It had to be. So Bridge from Below is three black. It was originally printed in Future Sight. Uh, It is an enchantment. Whenever a non-token creature is put into your graveyard from play, if Bridge from Below is in your graveyard, put a 2-2 black zombie creature into play token into play. Whenever a creature is put into an opponent's graveyard, if Bridge from Below is in your graveyard, you remove Bridge from Below from the game. Um, So this is the meat and potatoes behind any sort of dread strategy. Um, It's banned in modern, thanks to Hogak, because you were doing things with Altar of Dimension and things like that. Um, It sees play in Legacy and Vintage. The value of this card, to be able to turn something like a Narc Amoeba into one, two, three, four zombies, Um, it makes combat a nightmare because you can block and then come around on the backswing and boop somebody. Um, you can sacrifice it to Cabal Therapy. You're getting value out of that. Um, you know, really savvy opponents will know to kill their own things where you'll get the Delver players are like, oh, bought my Delver. Yep. They know the deal. But you'd be surprised how many people just don't know how to play around this card. Um, and this card can just run away with games if you know how to play it Dread Return. <laughs> You sacrifice three blood gas, get 12 zombies. Um, you beat Containment Priest thanks to this card. You sacrifice a thug, you make four zombies, and you kill them. Um, and so just a really beautiful, rare, weird design. Yeah. Um, and I just love it so much. This is... A- Go ahead. The first episode of The Magic Show that I ever did for Evan Irwin was with my buddy Nick Miller, and it was called The Future is Bleak, and it was a Future Sight preview show. It was magic show number 49. I had a ponytail. (laughs) We filmed it in Nick's dorm house. It was wild, and we went over a bunch of cards, and we talked about how Bridge from Below looked pretty good for Dredge. We thought, like, this might make Dredge pretty good. And then we moved on from that and started talking about Horizon Canopy or something. Um, (laughs) But yeah, Bridge from Below, man, magic history would be completely different if Bridge from Below had never been printed. There's nothing quite like it. Um, We could do an entire episode just on Bridge, uh, on, on Dredge stuff. On, like, you know, dredge win conditions. Um, You're right. It lets you play a completely different game. Um, It lets you get around traditional grave hate a lot of the time. It is, uh, it's, I mean, it's a spectacular card. It's one of those cards that also has the a real roller coaster when it comes to the financial history. Like this is a card that could reach the apex of 30, 40 bucks down to now it's like the ultimate masters, like 90 cents, like whatever. Right. So we're, we're in the trough right now, but you know, this thing wins a few It'll big come events. Back. It'll come back to like four bucks. Yeah. Yeah. This is the card that just comes out of nowhere and gets you. And uh, it, it, it was weird to kind of be weird. And then it was powerful, even though it was weird. And yeah. This is a, a the, signature uh, Aaron Campbell gold signature on the bottom <laughs> staple. 
the old sure. saying is that the best weekend to play dredge is the worst weekend to play dredge right yeah and so exactly. it, it just wins a tournament every six months and it's like oh i guess i should put hate back in my deck <laughs> oops forgot about that one and you yep. lost i have to say that was one of the neat things of watching hogak take over was people had never dealt with this card before and so right. watching people try to on the on the, the good side you know watching the hogak players try to figure it out the opponents are like i don't know what's going on man That's like true. it's just those were There's, good times there is the whole episode of bridge from below's history outside that of dredge which was hogak hogak mm-hmm. summer was you know got a card banned it was the most dominant deck in the format by a lot mm-hmm. and yeah yeah hogak was dumb and if you don't know what that card is you should look it up because it wasn't <laughs> fair yeah. altar of dementia yeah. Ooh, yes ridiculous well look when i was making this list as i want to do I look up, you know, cards, sort of the, all the tar- cards that say token or make a token or whatever, um, sort by different ways, EEH rec, by price, whatever, by, you know, memory that I have, yep. by power, by, you know, power of you know, what it did in the format at the time it was uh, available in standard. Mm-hmm. And I hit this one and bam, went to number one, just typed in number one, didn't even yep. think about it. I'll figure out two through ten as we go along. Because same. I did the same thing because I, I wanted something that had been banned or restricted or is banned or restricted. Check that mm. box. Did it win a Pro Tour or a Worlds? Check that box. Oh, yeah. Is it in the cube? Check that box. Is it in the top 128 on MTG bracket? Check that box. Is it uh, in the top 10 most played enchantments or not enchantments? Uh, uh, spoiler alert. Token makers of all time. Check right. that box. Um, it is also... Uh, I mean, no offense to fairy tauntings, but it's the best tribal enchantment fairy uh, that's ever been printed. You better do it right, Ruben. Well, just like Bridge from Below (laughs) has multiple bees, uh, our collective number one is Bitter Blossom. Bitter Blossom. I still cannot hear that in anything other than your voice. (laughs) Well, Bitter Blossom is a black and generic mana. For a mythic rare tribal enchantment fairy, they tried this tribal thing for a minute and then they quickly ran away from it. (laughs) At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose one life and create a 1-1 black fairy rogue creature token with flying. This card was bananas. This card was the best thing in standard. It was the bane of many people's lives at the time. Uh, At one point, I lost in a, I believe back then they were just called 5Ks. Um, yeah. there was a star city games, five K that I played against Alex Burton, Cheney. Mm-hmm. He was playing fairies. I was mm-hmm. playing mono red yep. and I lost that game. Mm-hmm. So match. that was, yeah, that match rather. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, yeah so bitter yeah, blossom that, in and of itself yeah, is a classic fairies. card. Just fairies stupid. was stupid. I mean, the deck fairies was stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and perhaps the most dominant standard deck to not win its corresponding Pro Tour, as that Pro Tour was won by Elves in the hands of Charles Gindy at Pro Tour Hollywood. Right. Anti Malin won Worlds that year with Fairies, um, of course, with Four Bitter Blossoms. Um, you know, turn one, either Thoughtseize or Ancestral Vision. Turn two, Bitter Blossom. Turn three, whatever. Spell Stutter Sprite, Agony War, Broken Ambitions, who cares? Turn four, Mistbind Click cryptic command you win the game from that point like it wasn't even close at that point right it just beat everything five of the top eight decks in that in that uh uh memphis worlds in 2008 were fairies um it was just an absurd deck an absurd time and then bitter blossom went on to have a second life elsewhere in black white tokens and in uh, even affinity sideboards started using bitter blossom because people were like haha shatterstorm and you were just mm-hmm. like haha turn one bitter blossom and people were just like uh, like here. it got so bad y'all sower of temptation is control magic on a creature and it's a fairy like mm-hmm. that was in standard with all of these busted encrypted command like it was i just put that crazy. in my grim grin decks that i could steal your creature and feed it to grim grin oh, <laughs> and then i could also it. just sacrifice the fairy to grim grin if i needed to <laughs> like they even brought back the man lands so you could play fairy conclave yes which, and mutavault mutavault yep. was all creature types of course, fairies, yeah. fairies yeah. is yeah. one of those tribes that just has a really really devoted following you know kind of like the merfolk people they will ride that deck into hell you know the fairies people too yuda takahashi is a big fan of, of fairies he will trot that deck out even when it's not good um, i think paulo's also been a fairy fan in the past um i know there's a large group yeah, of people paulo, in the illinois 
Paulo Paulo got second at Pro Tour Hollywood. Right. Yeah. There's a large number of people in in Chicago. I know several Illinois grinders that love themselves a fairy deck. Um, It's just got a really passionate following. And um, I know when Eldraine came around, people were really excited because they were like, more fairies, more fairies. And it didn't really pan out that way. But not really a fairy set. But you don't want it to be. Fairies had their time. I assure you, when it was fairies time, it was fairies time. It was fairies time all the time. And I get to play. I get to tell my favorite story about Bitter Blossom, which is my buddy Joe, who's in the finals of the PTQ, and he had mold down to four cards. And his opponent was like talking to his friends about travel plans to go to the Pro Tour. Mm-hmm. This was all, you know, was zipped up yep. and done. He had kept his seven. Buddy Joe's on four cards. Those four cards were Secluded Glen, Mute Vault, Scion of Una, and Bitter Blossom. And he yep. won that game, and he crushed that kid. Oh, and it sure. Was hilarious and I, I was, i'll never forget yeah. it i couldn't believe it i was like that's the perfect four card hand and it well was. the perfect core four card hand would have thought sees and then you would top deck the song <laughs> but top deck the, oh but still it was a it was a terrific for, for, collection for a mulligan to four you know as a as an aficionado aficionado of mulliganing to four digging for the perfect <laughs> four you don't need many cards you just need the right cards and bitter blossom is always the right card there you go. And it's our number one. And that was our top 10 token makers. You'll see them on the screen now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10. And we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. Move here to our final slide. Ooh, in HD. So I want to thank our sponsor. <laughs> it's true. So I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, my co-hosts, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching or listening. I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online on Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio-only podcast at Magic Mics Podcast at Libsyn.com, or find us on iTunes and Spotify. Or join us here next week, same time, same place, for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.